right, welcome everybody. And thank you for joining us today for our webinar on California's Cradle to Career Data System, learning from Texas and Massachusetts to operationalize data for attainment goals and planning. My name is Manny Rodriguez. I'm the Director of Policy and Advocacy here in California for the Institute for College Access and Success, also known as TICAS, and I'll be moderating most of today's webinar. In case you're not familiar with TICAS, we are a research and advocacy nonprofit organization focused on student-centered public policies that promote affordability, accountability, and equity in higher education. We work both at the federal level and at the state level with teams in California and Michigan. Before getting started today, I wanna to go over some logistical pieces. So today's webinar is being recorded and we will provide it to registrants after the event. It will also be posted on our landing page alongside our brief, which will go in depth on the great work Texas and Massachusetts are doing, which California can learn from. That link will be dropped into the chat shortly. We do have closed captioning options for today's discussion so that it is accessible to all attendees using the closed captioning feature at the bottom. If any tech assistance is needed at any time during the webinar, please contact TICAS's Associate Director for Communications, Angelique Palomar. She will drop her information into the chat shortly. Throughout the webinar, please feel to drop in any questions you may have via the Q&A feature. We will do our best to try them, try to answer them live or as a follow-up via our landing page. And last, but certainly not least, we had a last minute change to our speakers and Assemblymember Cardi won't be joining us due to an unexpected issue. In his stead, we will now be joined by the consultant for the Assembly Budget Committee, managing our public education and childcare funding portfolios, Aaron Gable. And with that, we will go ahead and get started. So over the past few years, TICAS has worked in community with many stakeholders to advocate for the creation of, and now the implementation of the Cradle to Career data system. This longitudinal data system will contain educational, workforce, financial aid, and social service information designed to address disparities and improve outcomes for all students by providing high quality information, and creating tools so that numerous types of stakeholders can use the information. In the most recent 2022-2023 state budget, the need for California's data system was expanded with the establishment of our new statewide attainment goal that 70% of working age Californians have a post-secondary certificate or degree by 2030, as well as goals around intersegmental collaboration via the multi-year agreements and plans with our public post-secondary segments. When we put all these pieces together, we now see that California has a North Star, North Star to guide our work with the data system providing us the necessary information and metrics to inform public policies, budgetary investments, and system level planning and implementation. Since California is one of the last states to establish a data system and set an attainment goal, we don't have to do this blindly. We can learn from the lived experiences of other states who have gone before us and have begun the work of planning for and making progress towards their attainment goals. Today, we will hear from some great speakers on the work their states have already set in motion. But before we go to them, I would like to do some level setting and hear from California leaders who can inform us about where California is at currently, why the cradle to career data system, the multi-year agreement goals, and the attainment goals critical for our state, and how we hope to operationalize the data to close opportunity gaps, outcomes for students. Now, without further ado, I will introduce our first California leader to start us on this conversation. He is the current Chief Deputy Cabinet Level Secretary for the Office of Governor Gavin Newsom, Ben Chita. Ben, turn it over to you. Thank you, Manny, uh, and thank you all for your time. Um, given that we're talking about data, uh, I figure it makes sense to start with some numbers. So first number is 170 billion. That's the California's total education budget this year, TK to 16. That's a number bigger than the entire budgets of all but two states. 
uh, just to give you some context. The other number I want to mention is 40 billion. Um, thanks to legislative leaders, including Member McCarty and their staff, that's the amount of education funding that has increased in just the last three years since the beginning of uh, the current administration, the news administration. Um, just to contextualize that, that increase, $40 billion, is bigger than the entire education budget of Florida. So think about it. We're taking these massive new investments and programs and grafting it onto our pre-existing uh, state structures. I, I mentioned those numbers to frame the key question before all of us, I think, which is how do we make sure that every penny Every penny of that $170 billion goes to actually improving the lived reality for our students, our family, our staff, and our school communities and uh, campus communities. That is the key question before us all for the years ahead. And that's where the various structural plays come in, the ones that Manny had mentioned. So the data system, the attainment goal, the compacts, the K-16 collaboratives, and any number of other structures that we're building out to not only increase the funding and promote implementation, but also transform systems for good. Uh, so in real time, what you're seeing is new architecture being built in policy. You're seeing the 70% attainment goal uh, to help guide where we're going. You're seeing the compacts to help guide how we'll get there and a data system to help us evaluate whether or not we're actually on the way. Uh, so that's where the data system comes in. The data system was one of the very first priorities that we advanced as the Newsom administration, and that very much was on purpose from the governor and our office's perspective. Uh, there's a lot of reasons why, and there's a lot of ways I could talk about why it's so important to us, but let me boil it down this way. Um, in almost every way, we put the onus on users of our students, that's students, that's, I'm sorry, users of our systems, that's students, that's families, uh, and others, to navigate the bureaucratic silos that we've established through our systems. That is the sort of MO of our current uh, status, the status quo. Um, that's not only bad practice, it's just unjust, <laughs> it's unfair. Uh, and so we can't live with it anymore. Um, our systems, uh, not only K-12 and post-secondary, but also health, social services, workforce development, everything, they just need to do a better job collaborating to serve students and actually center on their lived reality. And that collaboration begins with data sharing. So just like think about it for a second. Data sharing is just two systems talking to each other. That's basically what data sharing is. And so if we can't get our systems to talk to each other in that basic way, what hope is there for actually not only collaborating better together, but improving our systems and transforming them over multiple years? So that's why the data system is so critically important because fundamentally we need our systems communicating, collaborating, working together. And so our goal, our hope, and where I 100% believe we're on the path toward is to rebuild our systems with one single question in mind, which is how do we center all of our energies on the live reality of students and families? Not just the energy of education over here, not just the energies of health over here, or the energies of human services over there, or you know, workforce development, or you name it, uh, but rather all of us working together efficiently and energetically towards actually delivering for students and families. And for us, data sharing, the data system, all of the work, both, both analytical and operational that we're trying to advance the data system is a key component to being able to actually answer that question of how do we center all of our energies on the lived reality of our students and families and that is the charge ahead of us. That is the window of opportunity that we have ahead of us. It's a really exciting time. It's also a bit of an anxious and scary time. Um, and with that, uh, I wanna hand it back to Manny uh, to talk more about how we can actually deliver on this promise. Thank you for opening us up and grounding us with that framing and those numbers, Ben, appreciate it. Next, I'd like to introduce our second California leader, We'll touch on how legislature is hoping to use data to move us forward towards these goals, increase collaboration within our education system. She is the consultant for the Assembly Budget Committee managing our public education and childcare funding portfolios, Erin Gable. Hi, thank you so much uh, for allowing me to be here with you all today, pinch hitting for our subcommittee chair, Assemblymember Kevin McCarty 
and also here with my um, counterpart, uh, Mark Barton uh, on higher education policy. We've been uh, tag teaming this incredible movement around education data together on behalf of the committee. And you know, for the Assembly Budget Committee, our top education priority has been making sure that California's investments are actually paying off for our children and for our families. For the last two years, we have leveraged our historic budget surplus to make research-based investments across all sectors in our education system. Guaranteed universal preschool for all four-year-olds in the year before kindergarten. Increasing per-pupil spending in K-12 from what used to be the lowest quartile in the nation to what we're thinking is going to be the top quartile in the nation in per-pupil spending. Expanding college access in CSU and UC by nearly 30,000 students. Removing barriers to college by providing $4 billion over three years for affordable student housing and to prevent student homelessness. Expanding financial aid programs by allowing as many as 300,000 more students to access the Cal Grant program and adding 600 million to debt-free college for our UC and CSU students. These major investments will increase opportunities and impact the lives of California students from preschool to college. But it's one thing to appropriate, even based off the very best of national and international research. It's another to have a system that is geared around continuous improvement with student success at the center and an eye on improvement and accountability. Collecting data will be one of the state's key tools that we need to use to understand the impact of our investments and to make smart decisions about where to invest next and how to get better. California has set an incredible goal of reaching a 70% degree and uh, certificate attainment for working uh, aged Californians by 2030. The cradle to career data system will allow us to measure the impact of our state's early education K-12 and higher education um, investments and how they're impacting college degree attainment. It's also going to allow us, as Ben was saying, to identify gaps in public health, early childhood education, and other kinds of K-12 systems that could be impacting college attainment. The state will be able to look, for example, at the impact of our incredible transformative investments in community schools, after school for all, and transitional kindergarten, and to see how the data is following our students as they reach success after school. This big picture data will help California optimize its limited resources, hopefully inside a system of continuous improvement that will best serve our students and our economy over time. And of equal importance, as also was said, the system will help students and families ensure that they are on track for their life goals and success, and that they have financial information and aid at their fingertips. So on behalf of Assembly Members McCarty and Ting, and um, all of our colleagues here from the Assembly, just want to thank you for your advocacy uh, we know that this first step of data collection is just the first step. We're very excited to make that first step and then to see where we can go from there. So thank you and back to me. Thank you, Erin, for outlining all those investments in the past few years and laying out the vision on how the assembly can look to use the data to plan, measure the impact of policies, investments moving forward. Finally, I'm very excited to introduce our next speaker who can tell us the status of California's cradle to career data system at the moment and what is on the horizon. Uh, she is the executive director for the Office of Cradle to Career Data, Marianne Bates. Marianne, turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Manny. Um, and so I'm going to focus on giving you an update on the implementation and where we are. As you know, back in 2019, the legislature authorized an 18-month planning process, and this planning process led to detailed implementation recommendations that were generated with the insights and expertise of more than 200 people, not only from our partner entities here within the state, but also the intended users of the data system. And the planning process yielded a unique model for our data system and it's deploying a three-pronged approach. So a foundation for it is deep community engagement, which includes training and outreach on using the things that we build, but even more importantly, includes a lot of um, work to work with users and user-centered design in advance so we can inform the tools that we build and the information that we put together to ensure it's successful and actionable. We're working to scale tools to support college planning and transition, and we're building the analytical data set on education and job outcomes. So I'll spend the next few minutes giving you an update at a high level, but we'll also put all our detailed work plan in the chat so you can see what we have planned um, over the next four years. 
So on community engagement, we launched monthly community conversations. The public can join all of our meetings, including our board meetings, and provide input that way. And the legislation also author, authorized two advisory boards, and I'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, we also are working to scale up tools to support college planning and transition. So especially californiacolleges.edu, the state has invested in expanding this free resource, um, making it available to districts at no cost. And currently the expansions mean that about 1 million students in California have access to californiacolleges.edu accounts where they can apply to college, provide assistance in applying for financial aid and navigating that transition from college, from high school to college and then to career. The work plan details some additional data alignment efforts um, that we're working on in the coming years as well. And the focus of these practical uh, college and career planning tools is ensuring that we are creating and scaling up tools that are useful for students and families now as they navigate the different institutions and systems as they move from high school on to college. And then the third component is our longitudinal data system, the analytical data set on education and job outcomes. We sign legal agreements permitting data sharing across 16 entities for education, workforce, human services data, and we're currently procuring the technology tools necessary to build that analytical data set. We also launched task forces this past summer to help us refine data definitions for those dashboards. And this year, a real focus will be on user-centered design to ensure that the data is actionable. Let me talk for a moment about our governance, if we can go to the next slide. So last year, the legislation authorized the creation of our office within the Government Operations Agency. I report to a 21-person governing board. About half of those members are designees of our data sharing partners, and about half of them are appointees who represent the public and the end users of the data system. Our two advisory boards will be seated next week, and they will provide recommendations to the governing board related to the data and tools and also to community engagement. And so this governance structure really reflects an emphasis on building an equity focused and inclusive data system. A major focus for us this year is also going to be operations. So everything that goes along with setting up a new state entity and all of the policies and procedures for that, as well as staffing up our team. So big picture, we'll be focused in this next year on putting the plans developed during that planning process into action. And we're really grateful to be able to learn from other states. So I'm very much looking forward to today's conversation. Thank you and back over to Manny. Thank you very much, Marianne. So exciting to hear about kind of where we're at in the process and what we're moving towards. So kudos to you and your team as y'all are making this happen. And now I have the pleasure of introducing our external state leaders who are working in states that are a bit farther along the process of implementing their longitudinal data system and connecting it towards their established attainment goals. While there's no direct apples to apples to comparison for the process California has embarked on, both Texas and Massachusetts have had their attainment goals for a few years now and have a data system that allows their centralized higher education entity to use for the purpose of setting goals, planning for their future work grounded in racial equity, and producing data uh, that will be accessible to various end users. So with that, I would like to introduce our first speaker and state. He is the new Deputy Commissioner of Academic Affairs and Innovation within the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board, Dr. David Trowman. David, turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Fanny. Um, thank you, Fatikas, for inviting me today to uh, join the conversation. Uh, so I am three days in to being the, uh, the new Deputy Commissioner for Academic Affairs and Innovation of the Coordinating Board. But prior to that, prior to joining the Coordinating Board, I was the Chief Data Officer for the University of Texas System. And I'd been there for 15 years just trying to explore and connect and collaborate with federal agencies and state agencies to create longitudinal data so that we can truly understand and unpack how we can improve practice, policy, and student outcomes. Um, so today I wanna to provide you a brief overview of where we're at with the state of Texas, provide you some goal statements that, are, that we're striving towards, and then sort of highlight some lessons learned that we had experienced over the years of using longitudinal data systems. And so as you can see with our history of our longitudinal data system, uh, we received uh, Senate Bill 1, which was in 2002, so we're in 20, 20 years into this now, where we've tried to connect data together 
um, longitudinally across state agencies. Based on SB 21, it was requiring the state agencies of the education certifications, uh, TEA, which is the K through 12, and then post-secondary education, the Higher Education Coordinating Board to share, integrate, and uh, link data from P16. And then in 2006, based off of those linkages, the state required that we establish three centers. So three research centers or education centers based off of TEA, which is the K through 12, the coordinating board, which is post-secondary, and then the Texas Wolf Force Commission. So that's our Department of Labor to really link those data together and share that in a way that we can use and um, conduct research and allow the agency for researchers to conduct on-site uh, analyses understanding the impacts of policy and practice on student outcomes. Um, next slide, please. And then over time, as you can see, we've received a number of federal SLDS grants um, associated with the work that we'd already started back in 2002. Uh, so I, I view the state, long state longitudinal data system as this organic, ever-growing uh, information that needs to be maintained. I always say, if you create the beast, you have to feed the beast or the beast will attack you. So it, it takes a lot of effort and initiative and resources to make sure that you're maintaining the accuracy and the, the reliability and validity associated with SLDS uh, data. And so, as you can see, we receive millions upon millions of dollars to really improve and enhance our data systems, but also improve infrastructure priorities and uh, disseminating that information out. Most notably, we, we've created different types of data sources like TPAIR and also uh, resources for the education research centers, the three sites to really help um, get that information out. Next slide, please. And so when it comes to our uh, state goals of attainment for post-secondary education, I wanted to highlight uh, three aspects. This was just recently updated by our Commissioner Keller um, of the Coordinating Board. And really what we're trying to strive towards is, you know, fostering the skills and spurring the innovation vital for maintaining a, a, a lively and prosperous Texas economy. So with our attainment goals, we've specifically stated attainments of certificates and degrees so at least 60% of Texans have a post-secondary credential value. And so we'll get to the credential value in just a second, because I think that's a really important piece to discuss. Um, so we broke this out by age category of 25 to 34 and 35 to 64. It's a, we felt that it was important to look at more traditionally aged uh, college going students versus um, older adults that might be looking for their second, third, or fourth career and looking for additional education to strive towards that. So we've untangled those two. And then we also uh, wanted to identify post-secondary credentials of value aligned with the workforce demands so that it would raise incomes for income, uh, individuals, Texas, uh, and also reducing that debt. So ultimately, our goal is to achieve 550,000 students completing a potential uh, post-secondary credential of value each year. So what does that actually mean? We've created, we've used the longitudinal data system to really understand the investment that students are making outside of grant scholarships and tuition waivers. So it's really that net cost of attendance and looking longitudinally to see how much students are spending on a credential. And then we're also comparing and contrasting that with the American Community Survey data to understand whether or not that investment was worth it. And that's how we're defining a credential value. Did you recoup your costs in, in a timely manner within um, a, a time frame? And that's how we're defining a credential value. The other thing that we're doing, and that's why it's so important to look at financial aid data, is understanding that 95% of our graduates uh, with, uh, with no uh, undergraduate student debt or manageable levels of debt, how we've operationalized that is understanding that about 50% of our students leave with a credential with no debt, and that's important to highlight, but also understanding that debt to income ratios uh, are important. How much, how, much, how much of your earnings are you paying back into your student loan debt? And that's how we're identifying sort of the, the, the manageable debt component. And then lastly, we've tried to emphasize sort of research development innovation 
and we're, we're, we're really seeking to increase a $1 billion increase of the annual of private and federal research and development expenditures, and at the same time, increasing the number of research doctorates that are awarded by our institutions by 7,500 students. So it's a very ambitious goal, but I think we can do it. Next slide, please. And so on top of that, there was also uh, in 2016, the governor of Texas established the Tri-Agency Workforce Initiative. And that is the three agencies that I mentioned prior to, but what's nice about this initiative is it's, it's creating that North Star for all agencies in the state of Texas to strive towards. And what are they striving toward? They're trying to create pathways that are efficient, flexible, so that individuals can receive degrees, certificates, and other credentials that ultimately results in a higher wage in-demand job. And then at the same time, ensuring that all agencies are um, providing support to students necessary to succeed at all different stages of education as they transition to the workforce. And then lastly, um, the third priority is infrastructure, making sure that this, this infrastructure is robust and that there, that there has to be interagency uh, collaboration among those common goals. Next slide, please. So when we talk about advancing equity, I, I think it's important to highlight something that's very glaring in Texas. Over the past decade, 95% of the population growth in Texas came from communities of color. So with that said, we truly have to understand how we can meet students and families where they're at so that they can see themselves as a potential college student to receive a credential of value. Um, I also want to mention that one challenge that we face, and uh, we'll get to lessons learned in a second, but I think it's important to acknowledge this. When you're looking at longitudinal data, you're looking at historical data. So you have to make sure that you account for any biases with collecting those data or the populations that you're considering when looking at those longitudinal data. Because if you look at the longitudinal data from 20 years ago in 2002, when it started, the population is gonna look a lot different than the current incoming um, pipeline of students going into post-secondary. So that's always important to provide that context. And then uh, I, I'm really excited that equity is embedded throughout all of our goals. So any kind of indicators or goals that I've stated previously are gonna be disaggregated and reported by race, gender, income level, and geographic area in order to close the success gaps that exist in Texas. And all these goals are gonna be tied and we're gonna be creating these publicly available um, resources for students and families, higher education institutions, employers and policymakers to gain access to, to make those decisions. So next slide, please. So lessons learned, um, I think it's important to acknowledge that if you build it, it's not like they're gonna come. So I can build you a, a really amazing dashboard, i.e. football stadium, but if you have no fans and no team, it's an empty shell. And so I think that's something we have to consider and making sure that there's engagement on all levels for our stakeholders so that they can cut through the noise. I, I always talk about that. I feel like as a society, we are inundated with data noise on a daily basis, whether it be email, whether it be you know social media, and how can we cut through the noise so to make sure that, that families, politicians, policymakers have access to the information they need um, to make you know, the right decisions to closing those, those success gaps. I think the second thing to acknowledge is enhancing data agency. Um, when I was at the University of Texas system, that was one of my primary goals is to build relationships with individuals so that they could, they could communicate, access, and use data. Because um, at first, I, I really felt like if I created a dashboard and I gave them access to that dashboard, that they would use it. And that wasn't the case. Sometimes it can be overwhelming to the audience. And so you have to really help them along the ride so that they can feel ownership in those data and use them to improve policy and practice. And there are several things you can think about doing is developing data narratives, uh, developing easily accessible dashboards. I think the one problem is some individuals try to throw everything against the wall to see what sticks. And sometimes everything sticks and that can get really messy and confusing for the audience. And then lastly, just thinking about that, created a, creating a research feedback loop. 
There's going to be some fantastic research that results from the California Data Logistics System. There has been great things in Texas, but making sure that that information and findings from that research go back into the system to educate, inform, and enhance the data that you've already collected. And then um, we also noticed that it's state legislation is often needed to make sure that momentum is continually going. Um, because if one staff member who has a passion for this and they leave, you have to build a relationship over again. You have to make sure there's a legislation requirement that maintains that. And then lastly, just really specifically laying out equity-minded statements and, 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 and moving beyond just statements of students of color, but thinking about Hispanic women, African-American women, low-income families, or families from rural areas um, in your state to really tell that narrative of what's happening to those students. Back to you, Manny. Thank you, David, for that overview on how Texas is approaching this work and the lessons uh, learned. Now, I would like to introduce our second state to hear about their data system, their attainment goals, and how those pieces have helped create a new plan to meet their statewide goals with a centralized focus on racial equity. Representing Massachusetts, we have Elena Quiroz Libanis, Assistant Commissioner for Academic Policy and Student Success and Chief of Staff at the Massachusetts Department of Higher Education, and Mario Delson, Associate Commissioner of Research and Planning at the Massachusetts Department of Higher Education. Elena, Mario, I'll turn it over to you. Uh, good afternoon, good morning uh, to those in California. Um, I'm going to give you some history on the, of, of the, the SLDS um, in Massachusetts, and then Elaine, I'll talk more about our, our, our new equity agenda, and then I'll talk more about goal setting and how we're using the SLDS data, data. I want to put the context on this, that this is really the Department of Higher Education's sort of perspective on this process. Um, fortunately, I've been around um, in this position since, about, in this department since 2004, so I remember the, the years before and I experienced the creation and sustaining um, sort of the build out of the SLDS over the years. Um, so I have that. But again, it, it really is our, our so how we're using this data within our department, um, which is a little bit different than, uh, you know, a sort of state level approach um, across agencies. The SLDS um, in Massachusetts did not come out of any state mandate or state legislation. It was really the educational agency, particularly our K-12 agency pursuing um, a series of SLDS grants similar to the ones I think almost almost exactly the same years as the ones outlined and, and by, by David just now um, that were re used originally to, to help improve data collection and quality uh, partic particularly in K-12 and then was used to create the actual data warehouse the where you know the sort of the process for merging the data across the three educational departments you know how to match the data how to store the data um, how to secure the data um, and probably the, the nicest thing that came out of this was a portal for development and deployment of dashboards and reports using the data. You know, it was aimed primarily at practitioners um, and researchers at the at the um, at, at an institutional level, whether that was the elementary school or uh, you know college or institution or the, the agencies. Um, some really interesting reports on you know high school performance, um, K twelve early warning indicators, um, as well as some district analysis tools. Um, and the final piece was we were able to match in 2015, we were able to create a process for matching all of this to our wage record data from our state unemployment um, or you know, wage record database. And we're able to do some interesting analyses on uh, you know, wage record and you know, um, you know, earnings and employment uh, yeah, after, after college. Um, next slide, please. Uh, the key to all of this was not just having the money, but we had to have the governance in place. And, and I think our earlier speakers have mentioned this already. Um, we, especially in a state without felony legislation, I mean, there's been there's no legislation in Massachusetts saying we had to create the SLDS or just saying the SLDS or you know build up these kinds of resources. It really has been the initiative of the, uh, of the education departments and now the education secretariat to um, link this data for for all the really important reasons that have been outlined by the previous speakers. Um, and the first part of that was creating a place to store the data. Because prior to the SLDS, every agency owned its data and was responsible for management, managing access and security and, and, and use of that data. 
only by you know agreeing on a third party, in this case the IT department of the Executive Office of Education, where we're able to move forward with the actual build. And we also had to create the steering committee, which you know, others have talked about as well, having a committee that was involved in you know how the data would be accessed, stored, created, um, was really important. Um, oh, did I skip a slide? Was there a oh, there, there was a slide missing on lessons learned? Um, sorry about that. Hmm. So lessons learned <laughs> right before we get to this was one um, building the SLDS. Um, sustaining the SLDS is just as important, as difficult as building it. So, so you can build it, but to keep it going over time is, is really important. Um, it was, uh, you know, as Dave was just talking about, you can create a tool, you can create reports, but if you're not promoting access or, or use or providing trainings or getting, uh, you know, shares of understanding that these reports are still important and are relevant, then they, they, they become less and less used over time. And, and transitions, especially in K-12 and higher institutions, as people turn over, so the issue of knowledge of those reports and their availability um, begin to fade away. Um, governance is huge. If that governance structure falls apart, if you're not talking on a regular basis, um, you know, it, 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 rules of access, rules of engaging with the data become sort of less transparent and uneven across agencies. Um, but where we're at now is we have a new SLDS grant, which is really aimed around, you know, sort of um, give, uh, give take the full potential of, of the SLDS, promoting that shared ownership, you know, making sure that the data is being used in an actual way, increasing access um, to data, both externally into the public, but also across the agencies. Um, and so we're at an exciting time where we're, we're kind of learning um, you know, make, making up for the past and maximizing what's really, really is a tremendous data resource that's really been um, under, underused in, in recent years in Massachusetts. But I'd like to take the story now to you know, the department and our another focus on equity. The next slide, please. We, it, it, around Massachusetts and stay hard, basically, I think that's 2018, we were talking about the equity agenda. Um, in the Department, Department of Higher Education. And the equity agenda has really been informed by these data resources that we're talking about. In the build up to the, uh, in, 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 into adopting the equity agenda and achieving financial equity, we did a number of analyses focused on equity spotlights um, race and gender, geography and SES, progress and completion, financial aid, unmet need. And all of these um, spotlight reports really highlighted that there are really persistent racial equity gaps in the PK-16 pipeline in Massachusetts. And, um, you know, it, you know, both prior to and, and, and entering and after college, really, really different uh, gaps. But then the data was really important to sort of building the case to, you know, educating the board and building support for this sort of singular focus on racial equity. And it led to us adopting the, the equity goals that were critical to us becoming a, a limited tie, talent and innovation and equity state. But for more on that, I'll turn over back to, to Elena. Thanks so much, Mario. And on the next slide, you'll see the initial goals that Massachusetts started with. Um, and so one thing that I just want to share is that this is an agenda in Massachusetts that is constantly evolving. Um, and so like Mario pointed out, it really started the equity agenda here in the Commonwealth by us examining the data. And what we noticed was we actually hit our attainment goal. So we had established an attainment goal um, of 60% of adults in the Commonwealth uh, ages 25 to 64 would have some type of post-secondary credential by 2020. And lo and behold, we did meet that goal. And yet I imagine you might have not heard about it. Um, even though that's something that many people would think to celebrate, one thing that really caused education leaders here in Massachusetts to pause was the fact that we were so leaving so many um, student groups behind, particularly students who identified as racially minoritized. And so this led to the establishment of a singular focus on racial equity as a top policy and performance priority for the Department and Board of Higher Education. And what you see here is the reflection of the goals that we first established in 2020. Um, and one thing to note is that these are no longer the goals um, because we've evolved. Um, 
one thing that you'll you'll notice is here we talk about African American and Latinx students. Uh, unintentionally, we left Asian students and Asian American students and students who identify as Indigenous and Native American out of the picture. Um, so that's an example of a lesson learned where through the strategic planning process, um, which you can kind of see on the next slide, we realized that there are there was more work to be done if we truly wanted to be equity minded. So on the next slide, you'll see that we engaged roughly over 7,900 individuals in the development of a statewide strategic plan focused on one thing and one thing only, which was racial equity. And so we established a, a new set of goals, which I'll get to in just, a set, uh, in just a second. But really one thing I wanted to highlight here was the environmental scan. Data is so critical to all of the conversations that we have in higher education policy making. And I just really wanna give Mario a shout out and the institutions a shout out for being as transparent as possible and sharing their data with us. One thing that I think is really key when we're talking about data systems is establishing trust with all of the stakeholders to make sure that they feel comfortable with the way that we utilize the data when we are doing policy making. So this slide is really intended to show the different elements that went into the development of a 10 year strategic plan that we have here in Massachusetts that was adopted by the Board of Higher Education in June. And one thing to note is we know that we can't do this alone in higher education. We need our partners on the ground. We need our partners in community-based organizations. We need elected officials. We need industry. We need philanthropy. We need everybody to be on board to make sure that we can see more equitable outcomes when it comes to racially minoritized students here in the state. And so on the next slide, you'll see the vision and the mission that's outlined in this new strategic plan for racial equity, and we have a vision to develop and design a system of student-ready, race-conscious public colleges and universities that are equitable and racially just. They embrace the critical assets of our students of color, and they prepare them for success. And so our mission is also here, and you'll see that our goal is to continue to transform not only our programs and our policies, but the pedagogies utilized in the classrooms, the practices that we see both at the department in the and on the campuses to make sure that they're rooted in racial equity, because if not, we won't see our outcomes change. So we have to make sure that everything we do is equity minded from the jump in order to yield those more racially equitable outcomes. And so on the next slide, what you'll see is the goals that we set um, for this really important strategic plan. Um, and the strategies are identified on the second half. So the top half of this slide are a series of goals that specifically seek to increase for students of color in the Commonwealth. And so initially we were only looking at Latinx and black students. Now we're looking at black, Latinx, Asian American and indigenous students. And what we're trying to see is set goals and make sure that all of our students um, are doing well. And I'm gonna turn it over to Mario in just a second. But one thing that I, I wanna just continue to reiterate, it's a learning process. Um, so when we initially set goals, you saw that on the first slide, we had differentiated goals for different student populations. One thing that we're not doing this time is setting differentiated goals, but what that's, because what that signals is that we have different expectations for different student groups. And that's not the case. We have the same expectations for all of our students' groups. What needs to change is the way that we support those students in order to be equity-minded. So the top half here is the goals. The second half is the strategies that we are gonna move forward in partnership with our campuses and others to realize. Our main goal, which is to eliminate all disparities in public higher education outcomes. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mario, who's going to talk about goal setting. Uh, next slide, please. Elena covered a lot of this for me already in terms of how we're going to go about doing this, but we do have our, our, our system goals. Um, you know, really, uh, uh, sort of that lifelong outcomes of integration degree completion and social mobility. And we also have goals for what we call in Massachusetts, the segments, the, the community colleges, the state universities, similar to the Cal State system, UMass, similar to, to the UC system, where we're setting, because of the, the trajectories of students are so different in those three segments, um, there are goals set at that level, um, as well as the system goals. Um, and these are goals we hope that we plan to achieve by 2033. And if you go to the next slide, a bit more how we're gonna go about doing this. Um, 
I think, as, as you already mentioned, each of these goals will be aggregated by race ethnicity. Um, but the, the, as Elena just explained very eloquently, we're setting a single goal to be achieved at, at each level. So, for example, let's say for UMass, we set a, a persistence rate, a uh, retention rate goal of 85%. That would be for all students. Um, and how we illustrate progress is through disaggregation, where you can be able to identify, um, you know, students that are, you know, which, which groups have, you know, need, need more support, more focus, more target interventions in order to achieve the, the desired goal. So it's our way of holding ourselves accountable for all students achieving uh, an agreed to high level of, of you know, high level outcome by 2033. Um, obviously, the SLDS data and digging into historical data is critical for this. Um, but even more important, as you can imagine, this is pretty sensitive work and, and having and making the data this transparent um, can 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 lead to some difficult conversations. And if you go to the next slide, I can talk a little bit more about that and then wrap up. And, and that is around this consultative collaborative process um, that Elena mentioned. We, we do all this in partnership with our institutions. Um, we're fortunate in, the, in recent years to developed a, a new data governance structure where we have a data council representation from each institution, public institution in Massachusetts, um, and a, a steering committee, a residential steering committee, the president's provost at the higher level. And as these groups, especially the data council that we're meeting with um, almost monthly, as we illustrate you know, the data and illustrate how we're making, making these goals, um, so, so when, they, when we get to a final set of goals, there are no surprises, and everybody has one voice. And, and that's important, I mean, to the SLGS, that's important to the equity agenda and how we use the data, is having this shared understanding of the value of the data and how we're using it, and that we agree to and have shared agreement on uh, on its importance. And so that's our uh, where we're at now in terms of SLGS and how we're using that data for the equity agenda work. We'll turn it back to Manny. Thank you for that overview, Mario and Elena. It's nice to see the good work y'all are doing in Massachusetts. For this next section, we'd like to dig a little bit deeper on some of the pieces that Massachusetts and Texas touched on through a Q&A. So to help moderate this section, I'm pleased to introduce a close colleague who was appointed to the Cradle to Career Data System Community Engagement Advisory Board. She is the Executive Director for the Northern California College Promise Coalition, Mayor Curry Nunez. Mayor? Thank you so much, Manny, for that introduction. I hope you all can hear me okay. Manny will let me know if you can't. I'm very grateful to be in this space with leaders and colleagues across California and the country. For this section, I'd like to remind folks to submit any questions they may have, and the TICAS team will work with our panelists to get your responses live or as a follow-up on the landing page. So for this section, I'd like to welcome back Dr. Troutman, Mario, and Elena so we can chat a bit further on the work Texas and Massachusetts have already done. Uh, so with the first question, how did you get buy-in from your post-secondary segments and other institutions to share their data and to be honest about their bright spots or challenges to address racial inequities? That, would anyone like to get started, David, Elena, or Mario? I'm not shy, so I'll go ahead and get started. <laughs> I think that's a, a that's a fantastic question, and it's also a really challenging one at that. Uh, I think what what we've tried to do is create a partnership with institutions so that they feel like they're going along with they're going along with the ride with us, and not saying this is what you have to do, right? Um, and I think one thing that one thing that I'm struggling with, honestly, is um, yes, it's it's excellent to think about completion, and and that's where we need to strive. But what we're finding using the longitudinal data is that the earnings outcomes are not equitable across race, ethnicity, gender, and low income status. So just because they finish that line doesn't mean that we're we're done wrestling with these numbers and making sure that students are receiving a computer science degree who's an African-American female are receiving the same rates of return that a white or Asian man will in that same field of study. So um, what we've tried to do is build relationships um, 
starting with, you know, the coalition of the willing, and then you expand because people start seeing the, the data and information and, and, and get excited about it. And like, well, I want to be a part of that. So you have to build that sort of collaborative coalition um, to make it successful. Thank you for sharing that, Dr. Troutman. Elena or Mario, any thoughts? I think this is a spot where Mario and his team should get a lot of credit. And I, I might um, change the word from buy-in to engagement because I feel like that's part of the difference. And it's not that we need them to buy in. All of this has been co-created, right? So from the performance measurement reporting system, which were statutorily, uh, statutorily mandated to do the metrics there is something that Mario and his team uh, developed by conversation or through conversation with our institutions of public higher education. We now have a data council that's really helping um, to inform the development of the goals. And so we, the data council, their purpose isn't only to develop the goals for the strategic plan, but it's a group that exists with a lot of key stakeholders. And so giving them tangible projects to also work on so that they see that they're engaged partners, I think is something that, that allows us to have continuous conversations with um, this key set of folks. I just wanna recognize that Dr. Delcy gets a lot of credit for that relationship building and maintenance here in the Commonwealth. Thank you. And I would add behind the scenes for the data geeks, we, we are creating, we, we, we built a real extensive Tableau analytics uh, system where schools are able, we, we design dashboards for each of these metrics and PMRS and the equity agenda, where the schools are able to um, actually download the data source and attach their own data and, and use the same tools we're using to track progress, to track progress at the campus level with additional information they have. So we're making their data more actionable at the system level, but also at the institutional level and give them access to the wage record data and the K-12 data that they may have had access to in, in the past. So I think giving something in return, that would definitely helps along with the, with the process. Absolutely, and thank you for sharing those thoughts. So getting folks engaged, um, bringing the coalition of the willing, those early adopters who are um, gonna be available to help you get folks excited to bring more um, folks who will be willing, um, and then bringing them something in return uh, to show uh, what that collaboration was able to achieve together. Thank you for those insights. Um, and then last question for um, due to time, could you tell us about the process your states went through to connect the data that was held by the different entities or systems? How did you actually plug those pieces together? And what if any data validation challenges or reporting challenges did y'all encounter? I would say real quick, I mean, encountered and continue to encounter because the, the challenges don't go away, um, especially as you bring in new additional resources as, you know, each agency changes its data collections, collects new data, adds new things, um, it, it, it is difficult. And it just takes lots of meetings, <laughs> lots of understanding um, and continual refinement, especially for us on, on the data matching, making sure we're matching, you know, a to A, B to B, it, it, it can be really difficult um, across. So it's just continuous engagement and re review of, of, of the data. I'm, I'm completely aligned with Mara. It's an ongoing, you're feeding the beast. So, uh, because we have to also think about the in-migration, my out-migration that takes place within a state and how families are more fluid with migrating. And so we have to figure out following you know, the right students, um, capturing the data at the right time and setting up, you know, quarterly required meetings so that agencies have to actually sit down and talk through issues that they might be experiencing. Thank you for sharing that, Dr. Trotman, Dr. Uh, Delcy, Elena, anything else you'd like to add? Well, thank you. Um, acknowledging that this part around um, connecting the data, maintaining, validating is an ongoing process and requires continued commitment. We really appreciate all of your insights today. And just to close out, thank you for digging a bit deeper into these issues and giving California stakeholders and leaders things to consider as we move this work forward towards our attainment goals and further develop our longitudinal data systems. Thank you so much, Dr. Trotman, Dr. Delcy, and Elena. 
Uh, to close us out for today, I am so happy to introduce the research director for TKIS and an appointed member of the Cradle to Career Data System, Data and Tools Advisory Board, Dr. Marshall Anthony. Thank you all so much for joining us today to talk about data systems and efforts happening throughout the country, which can inform California's ongoing process. Uh, throughout our time together, we learned that statewide attainment goals are essential for increasing post-secondary educational levels and future workforce needs. As noted earlier, Governor Newsom recently announced an effort for California to reach a 70% attainment goal among working age Californians by 2030. And we had the pleasure of learning from partners right on the ground in Texas and Massachusetts about their experience of using their state data systems to reach their attainment goals. As, uh, as just was mentioned, as a recently appointed member of the Cradle to Career Data Systems Data and Tools Advisory Board, I must say that I'm personally excited uh, to see how this work will unfold in the great state of California. Um, but a couple of housekeeping things right before we end. Um, before we wrap up, I'd like to remind folks that the landing page for this webinar will have the recording from today, as well as our accompanying fact sheet, which goes deeper into the work and lessons learned from Texas and Massachusetts. And in the future, we'll house the responses to questions asked via the Q&A feature. I know we were running uh, shorter on time in that, uh, in that section of the webinar. And then lastly, uh, you will be redirect redirected to a quick host attendee survey. Uh, your feedback is essential for uh, future enriching, uh, enriching events such as this. So we encourage you to complete it um, at your earliest convenience. And with that, on behalf of the TKIS team, thanks so much again for joining us today and have a great rest of your day.